to doubt religious doctrine and rethought the concept of hell. Jerry preached for the last time in his church April 2011. That was when he joined the Clergy Project, a confidential support group to help religious leaders who no longer believed in God or God. Six months later, Jerry was the first member of the Clergy Project to come out of the closet and publicly announced his deconversion. Since then, Jerry has been the executive director of Recovering from Religion and has been the focus of numerous newspapers, magazines, uh, coverage, and internet, uh, internet articles. Google his name, it's amazing. Jerry appears in numerous YouTube videos and has given many lectures on free thought and atheist events. Jerry's autobiography, Hope After Faith, an ex-pastor's journey from belief to atheism, is based on his career and his experiences. Jerry was born and reared in Louisiana. And I, too, was born in Louisiana. And as a Southern gal, I know that it's good manners to not take up too much time with this introduction. So I present the great and the one and only Jerry DeWitt. instructions today. I've been told that I am to wake you up, fire you up somewhere or the other. Yeah, JT needs a little waking up. And, uh, and also to work the room since the room is set up a little differently than what we originally intended. And so I guess, I'll be honest with you, I, I get confused with Sam Singleton so often. <laughs> that I try to hold back on my preaching just a little bit and uh, be a little more uh, like a professor, if you will. But since it is this early, and it is Sunday morning, and we are here already, I'm wondering if it'll be all right. Up. What's fun for me is, is that people think I'm preaching when I'm really only talking. <laughs> and so maybe you won't know the difference one way or the other. It is a privilege to be here. I'm going to tell you, it has been a horrific and miserable experience getting here. I won't lie to you. It's taken a lot to get here. Whether you know it or not, whether you've read my book or not, you will soon find out that I've always been in pursuit of this little place called home. My life started off somewhat chaotic. My father was an alcoholic and ended up dying in a car accident very early in my life. And that caused us to, to move into my grandmother's house, my mother's home. My mother's mother's home. And there's this beautiful piece of furniture. Now, don't get me wrong, you wouldn't find it that attractive. You would have had to started setting and worshiping at this table at the age of three to appreciate its beauty and to understand its majesty and to know that it actually is, despite what Stephen Hawkins or anyone else might say, it actually is the center of the very universe itself. There's this beautiful kitchen table. This kitchen table was built by my great-grandfather. He actually carved the legs himself, put the table together, and covered it with, with what I now know to be just some linoleum floor cover. And then he banded it together with this beautiful chrome metal band around the outside edges to hold the linoleum to this wooden table. I told you it was gorgeous. <laughs> But that table quickly began to symbolize to me a place of acceptance, a place of safety, a place where I was wanted, where people wanted me to set. For a long time, actually for 12 wonderful, 
magical years, I was not only the only child in our immediate family, I was the only grandchild. And then at the age of 12, this other little son of a bitch came in the world. <laughs> and I knew that my world was over one morning. I was sitting on a beanbag chair, another wonderful piece of furniture, <laughs> watching cartoons one Saturday morning, and my uncle, and thus my cousin, this other person, was visiting. And my cousin crawled up, still in nothing but a diaper, crawled up and took with the two teeth that he had already received, took out a plug from my arm. And I bolted from this little beanbag chair and ran into the kitchen screaming for assistance and for justice to be performed. <laughs> and I knew that my life was over whenever my mother looked at me and said, well, maybe he just wants the chair. Let him have it. <laughs> Now that's the least of anyone's worries, but over a course of time, this center of the universe, this, this god-awful looking kitchen table, it became, it became this place where questions could be asked and where connections could be made as my mother and my stepdad would go through their dance of separation and ultimately divorce my mother would grab me up at two and three o'clock in the morning and we would race to my grandmother's and we would wake my grandmother up and my grandfather up and my mother would begin to pour out her story and her justification for interrupting a night's sleep and yet moving into my grandparents' home yet again. And it would all happen around this table. And because there was no room for me there, there was a small cot that I would sleep on and at 4.30 and 5 o'clock in the morning, I would, I would slowly come away to the murmuring, the quiet murmurings of adults talking about very serious issues in the background. And I would wake up and I would pretend to still be asleep so that I could hear the gossip and so that I could learn just how horrible my stepdad really was. And I would listen to the stories and it would all take place around this kitchen table. I would lay there pretending to be asleep cracking my eye open just enough. You know the way that it looks whenever you first begin to open your eyes and the light is glaring and it blinds out all of the surroundings, but slowly but surely you begin to visualize and you begin to see your surroundings. And I would smell the coffee and I would hear the conversation and I would know that no matter how chaotic the world was, no matter how messed up our family was, no matter how much confusion there was even in my very young life, there was this place called home, and it centered around this kitchen table. So obviously, after the course that I've been through for the last two years, it was actually only a year ago, last month, that the first article broke out about our story in the New York Times. Oh, we, yeah, that's a good one. Woo! -hoo! That's fine, you clap. If that wakes you up a little bit, you're welcome. One week later, there was a book deal. The New York Times, and then one week later, a book deal. And I was excited about it because I knew that there was this story to tell. I knew that I wanted people to, to feel and to sense this journey that I've been on and why people do what they do and how it is that you can grow to the ripe old age of 42 and still believe things, but then yet change your mind and risk your entire world and risk your home and risk not being allowed to comfortably sit at the kitchen table anymore. No longer able to stand in the axis in the center of the universe the way that you once did. Because home creates this wonderful, this magical feeling. Maybe your home life wasn't that great, but I'm sure you can still understand whenever I say the word home with such affection. Maybe in some cases with such fantasy. Home is a place of acceptance. Home is a place of safety. Home is a place where you're wanted. Home is a place where you're valued. Home is a place where you're missed when you're not there. And so, like many of you, I risked the idea of home in order to be true to myself. So the book deal is made. And within a few weeks, the publishing process, this, this wonderful, light and fluffy, exciting process called publishing begins. 
And the first thing that happens, everyone had been lovely and friendly and accepting. They felt kind of like home. They were valuing the story. They were wanting me to tell my story. Everything is light and fluffy and wonderful in the publishing world. And suddenly I get a call and they say, Jerry, we need to talk to you about something. We, we, we've been talking here in the office. And we're not so excited about your title. We want, we want to come up with a title. Now, you're going to be surprised to know this, but the title of the book, Hope After Faith, wasn't my idea. They came up with the idea of Hope After Faith. And when they told me, it is the most angry that I have been in my adult life. I became so angry at this idea that they had come up with the title of this book. Literally, I must be stroke proof. <laughs> Because I cussed and fussed and slammed things around and broke items and had such a connection that my son, many of you have met him, Paul Aaron, literally had to hold me up and say, it's going to be all right. I was so angry at this idea of hope after faith. And at first, I thought the reason that I was angry about this idea was because it just sounded like another atheist book to me. And I didn't want to tell just another atheist story. I wasn't interested in creating some deconversion tool. Instead, I wanted all of you to come home with me. And so I had a different idea altogether. But the, what was really going on down on the inside was this title, Hope After Faith. When I would hear those words, I had to recognize that I moved away from faith. But I had yet to truly find hope. That's just a year ago. Now we can brag, especially whenever it's just among friends, and we can pretend that we've got all the answers and that we've got it all figured out and that it's all so easy and simple, but we know that's not really true. We know that life is still complicated. Life's complicated whether you add gods to your life or not, and life can still be very complicated when you take gods out of the equation. When you take mythology, when you take religion away, it's still very complicated. There's still relationships. There's still this damn kitchen table that I'm no longer allowed to sit at comfortably. And so I felt like to try to come up with this hope after faith was pushing the issue because I had yet to discover what the hope was. Oh, it's fine to say I'm no longer bound up by religious obligations. I'm no longer being led astray by superstition. But we all know that's not what we mean when we say hope. Just like whether or not you've ever had the type of home life that I experienced or whether you've ever appreciated even the word home, you know home can have a greater meaning. And whether you've ever had hope or tried to embrace hope, you know that hope can have a greater meaning. You know that there's a way to say it. There's a way that you mean it. That in the darkest of circumstances, that just uttering that word, that there's still hope, is able to secure those broken hearts. That's able to bring the slightest smile, even in emergency rooms. Just to say, don't, don't worry just yet. Give it a little time. I know the doctors haven't diagnosed it. I understand that you don't know how it's going to work out. It's more than understandable that you don't know which direction your relationship's going to go. I know you've yet to find a job, but understand me. You're qualified. You've got some skills. You've got some abilities. Don't worry about it. There's still hope. Can I get a Darwin? Darwin. So there's something fantastic about this word hope. And I felt like to just stick it on the cover of the book when I had yet to find it, for a lack of better words, was almost blasphemous. And so I wrote the book pretending that that was not the title. And I brought you home with me. The audio book's now out. It's been produced by Dogma Debate, LLC. Thank you. And I tried even harder, because it was my own voice, I tried even harder to bring you home with me. I don't necessarily talk about the table, but you get to sit at the table with me in all types of circumstances. And so we sent the draft off to the publisher. And they called back and they said, man, this is great. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. You've written the subtitle so well. <laughs> An ex-pastor's journey from elite atheism. Congratulations, you're almost done. 
I said, but we don't see a whole lot of hope yet. <laughs> and I remember at probably about midnight on a Skype call with my co-writer, he said, well, what are we going to do? I said, I don't know because I don't know where the hope's at. I don't know where the hope's at. The title of today's talk, and I won't be much longer, is that home is where the hope's at. When I think of home, I think of the great state of Louisiana. You don't have to love it for me, you can love it for Margaret. <laughs> if you can bring a Margaret to the world, there's a lot of hope for Louisiana. Right. Darwin. Darwin. When I think of home, I think of Louisiana. But Louisiana is losing its mind with creationism. The governor is so easily taking our education system completely off track. And we're now setting the standard for ignorance. Raising the bar, if you will. Or lower. Or lower. And so then I think a little more clearly, I say, well, it's not so much Louisiana that's home. But it's Beauregard Parish. That's right, we call ours parishes, you call them counties. We forgive you. <laughs> but Bulgar Parish, the administration over Bulgar Parish, are the same people that bullied my best friend, my boss at the time, into firing me because of the few things at that time you could Google and find out about me on the internet. So that's Bulgar Parish. So, so maybe, that's, maybe that's not quite home either. Maybe it's this little wood frame home with a tin roof that possesses this wooden table that we would bounce back and forth to for years. Maybe that little structure is home. Maybe it's the smell of grandmother's cooking. Maybe it's the memory of my grandfather's recliner sitting in the corner and him wearing his white t-shirt and his blue mechanic pants with his legs crossed and one leg thrown over the arm of the chair watching television. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's that little piece of pipe that is still stuck in the ground that once held the longer pipe that positioned the antenna. <laughs> that I would go out at night and spin that pipe as anybody ever turned an antenna. <laughs> ah, now we can preach a little bit. <laughs> Hearing my grandfather's voice penetrate the dew throughout the night saying, that's good. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. No, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> There's this thing called inertia, Grandpa. <laughs> Maybe that place is home. But it's not. And I want it to be so damn bad. But it's not. Because Papa's been dead now for over 20 years. And nobody lives in that house. My grandmother, the Pentecostal matriarch of our family, now lives in a double wide trailer next to it under the supervision of my mother. And so that, that fortress of solitude, that place of safety, the center of the universe has now been turned into a perpetual garage cell. And so that's my home. So maybe home, maybe home is closer to home. Maybe, maybe home, and y'all stay with me for a moment. I'm going to try to be tough through this. Stay with me. Maybe home is in a relationship that I've had for 23 years. Maybe it's between me and this other southern gal. Maybe there's the place of acceptance. Maybe there's the safe place. Maybe, maybe that's the place where I'm valued. Maybe, maybe that's the place where I'm wanted. Maybe that's the place where I'm missed. But it's not. It's not home anymore. She's gone. And that illusion that, that someone outside of me, that illusion that some place outside of me, that illusion that there's a fixture, a piece of furniture, that there's an idol, that there's something materialistic, that there's something temporal, that illusion that there's something outside of me that is able to create home for me is now broken. And I know it sounds as if I'm violating the two requests that I've been given. I've yet to get out and walk among the tables, but thank you all for showing up. There's hardly room. 
And I also know that I'm not necessarily revving you up, but like any good message, we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I thought that would be home. And I thought it would be home for forever. But even those most, those most intimate relationships are home. And so, as I sat on the Skype call with my co-writer and I'm pissed off because I've got this crazy book named Hope After Faith and I don't feel any hope, I'm trying to figure out where is hope? What creates hope? What is this, this source of hope? You want to tell me I'm supposed to be excited because I now know that I'm going to die and not live forever and this is my one life we need to give it everything you've got. <laughs> Well, that might be great if the light bill wasn't still due. That might be great if everyone around you accepted you, loved you, valued you, made you safe, wanted you, or missed you when you were gone. But that was no longer the case either. What I want to share with you this morning is that there is this place called home. And home is not even where the heart is. Because I'm entirely too sentimental. And for me, home, if home was where the heart was at, then I'd be in serious trouble. And, and I know all of you single ladies want to date me, and this is going to be a real problem for you to say this. <laughs> but in a lot of ways, my heart is still with that other Louisiana lady. And that's no longer home. In so many ways, my heart is even still with the congregations that I pastor. I will admit to you because what the hell can you do to me now <laughs> that on Sunday mornings when for some crazy reason I am up around church time when I drive by the field parking lots of those past churches I miss them. And if home was where the heart is I would be in trouble because my heart is still sitting on those pews. Even more so, my heart is still behind those pulpits. I'm sorry, you lifelong atheists. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. These people are intelligent. These people are sincere. Yes, as David Silverman said yesterday, they are victims. Can I get a darn All right. What the biggest Darwin ever got, but it's okay. <laughs> it's her, exactly. So if I was looking for home where the heart was at, then I would be in trouble. And what good would I be speaking on a Sunday morning if I didn't quote at least one scripture? I would be able to agree with the Apostle Paul. Of all men, I would be most miserable if home was where the heart's at. But I've got news for you. Home isn't where the heart's at. Because we're growing up. I'm growing up. Having everything stripped away. Family, friends, finances, favor from a community that I've worked within my entire adult life. Having all those things stripped away and no longer being allowed to sit at that kitchen table with any sense of comfortableness. Having all of that stripped away has forced me to grow up. It's forced me to mature. It's forced me to look in directions that I would have never willingly looked at. And what you need to understand this morning is that home is not even in a movement. Because home has to be stationary. It does have to be the very center of your world. And a movement is in movement. It can't be stationary. It is evolving in the marketplace of ideas. It's always changing. And if you feel like it's home one moment, just give it a couple of more blog posts and it may not feel like home. <laughs> but that's not a problem. Stay with me for a minute. That's not a problem. That's not a problem. That's the answer. You've got to understand that the answer is not in solving the problem. The answer is in asking the question. 
It's not in them in the movement now. It's not in determining that it's us for and no more and that it's, this is the only way to do it. That smells a whole lot like of what I've been stepping in for 25 years. <laughs> what makes us special, what makes a real home is where you find hope. Because home is where the hope is. Home is where the hope is. Go away. And no matter how much of a romantic you are, it's not in that other person. It's not in a spouse. It's not in children. It's not in movement leaders. It's not in your favorite book. It's not in any particular location. It's not even found around Momo's kitchen table. But hope exists within you. You are the hope. You are your own home. And nobody can take it away from you. That's home. This is your home. You, right here, right now. Atheism is just the beginning of self revelation. Atheism is just the first step. It is one of the most important steps that we can take to free ourselves from a culture of illusion, of a culture that ties us down. Each and every one of us possess. A personality, a uniqueness that's like a hot air balloon that's been chained down by our culture. That's been chained down by ideas that we've inherited from people that don't even know that we're alive. But that's not our home. Our home is in the clouds. Our home is to scrape the top of the atmosphere and to experience what it means to truly be ourselves. To be ourselves fully. Home is where the hope is. It was fantastic. It was a fantastic moment when I realized that through all of the struggles that I had gone through, through all of the loss that I had suffered, and through all of the prayers that I thought were answered, prayers for strength, prayers for support, prayers to feel valued, it was fantastic to realize that those prayers were not answered from the outside. Those prayers were answered from the inside. It's the relationship I possess with myself. It's the love affair I have with me. It's the kitchen table of my own heart. Ah, you want to preach with me. I know, you just don't know how to do it. Whether you know it or not, you're within feet of my home. You're within feet of my birthplace. You're within feet of my well of hope. And I know it turns everyone off, and I know that so many of my Christian critics say, can you believe that that tall, good-looking... <laughs> oh, it makes me so mad when you laugh. <laughs> you wouldn't wreck the furniture of my own home. I put your ass for good. It blows their minds. How dare you? How dare you? And they even look at the atheist movement and they say, how dare you? How dare you say that it's your strength? How dare you say that it's your internal fortitude? How dare you say this? I say, how dare they give the credit to anyone or anything else? So this morning, regardless of how far you are from Momo's kitchen table, or whether you're ever allowed back there again, you've got to know that you've got a home. You're at home. Because your home is where your hope is. Thank you.